Do you ever notice how many trees there are? I've heard it said that there are more trees than stars in our galaxy. That's amazing to think about, isn't it? That something as big as a star should be outnumbered by the trees on our planet. Or those in our galaxy, at least. That's a lot of trees. They're all very old, aren't they? So very old. Older than us. Maybe somewhere out there is a tree older than the dinosaurs. Buried in a mountain, somehow, somehow having survived millions of years. I know we find fossils of trees, but what if those fossils weren't dead? It's interesting to think about that, that there could be a tree out there older than all of mankind's history. You think trees have thoughts? After all, trees are alive and every living thing has some kind of mind and intelligence driving it. And if so, what do they think of us? I've got a fair idea what they think about humankind. I'm a park ranger. And this is my story. It all began when we got a call that none of us had been wanting to receive. A child had gone missing. This wasn't unusual. People go missing all the time in the parks. However, what made this one unusual was how it happened. Maxie Payton had been out with his mother in a picnic. At 13 years old, he was a wild and rambunctious child. And if there was one thing he loved doing more than any other, it was climbing trees. Now, if only he'd been more of a video game kid than an outdoors kind, then perhaps all this could have been avoided. See, it was when he was climbing a tree that he disappeared. His mother recounted everything in detail. They picked out a nice clearing in the edge of the woods, near a large clump of trees that Maxie could climb as he pleased. We set up the blanket right here. Maxie wanted to climb that big pine tree, she pointed at it. I took my eyes off him for only a moment. Just one moment, and when I looked back, he was... And she utterly broke down. The first thing we did was check out the tree in question. It was a pine tree, one of the tallest I'd ever seen. Clearly, it was very old. How high up was he when he vanished? I asked his mother. A little skeptical, a kid could just disappear without a trace while climbing a tree. He was... He was... Halfway up. Then she continued sobbing. After that, it was obvious we weren't going to get anything else out of her. Still... I walked around that tree twice and I could clearly see the snapped branches and twigs where Maxie had climbed up. They ended at about halfway up. It was like he just stopped climbing, then disappeared completely. We did a thorough search of the area first and found nothing. Well, almost nothing. See, about 50 yards from the pine tree, I found a shoe, covered in pine needles and tree sap. It was red and blue, a Nike brand symbol on the side. It seemed to have been there for a long while. But when I bent down and picked it up, what I found inside planted the first seed of doubt that this wasn't just a case of a woman losing track of her child. There, written in black permanent marker, was a name. Maxie Payton. So how did it get here? Maxie's mother was hysterical, and became even more so when I brought her the shoe. That's it! That's my Maxie's shoe! She grabbed it. Clutching it close to her chest, she wailed and wailed. We had to take her away. Taking the shoe from her was difficult, but both physically and emotionally, that woman held the shoe to her chest like it was a baby. I'll never forget how much that woman cried as she was taken away. Sad to say, but the shoe was the only evidence we had of Maxie and where he'd gone. She was escorted to the park center, where she'd wait for the paramedics. We know that she wanted to help, but in her condition, she'd only be a hindrance. The moment she was out of sight, however, was when one of my partners spotted Maxie's blue shirt at the top of another pine tree, hanging from a branch by the collar a hundred yards in the opposite direction of where we found his shoe. He swore up and down that the shirt hadn't been there when we would first looked, and did so with such conviction that none of us doubted him, even if we wanted to. He knew we had to get that shirt down somehow, it was evidence, but then again, how had the shirt gotten up there? Unlike the pine tree Maxie had disappeared from, this one had no signs of anyone climbing it. No broken twigs, branches slightly bent from where someone had climbed up and left the shirt. There were five of us when we went to first look for Maxie, excluding myself. We didn't think we'd need that many, because frankly, people go missing in the park all the time. Often they turn up in about a few hours. But we'd never dealt with something like this. Staring up at that shirt covered in pine needles, I think it began to dawn on all of us 
that we were dealing with something we weren't trained for. We radioed for backup while trying to figure out how to get that shirt down. I volunteered to climb up. The very first branch I grabbed, however, broke in half instantly. In the process, scratching me across the hand, I cried out looking at the gash across my palm. It wasn't deep, but the skin had been broken. Blood was already pooling in it. Groaning at the sharp pain, I clutched my hand in a fist, trying to stifle the bleeding. I glared, stunned, at the large branch which had just snapped when I touched it. My blood was already seeping down it towards the ground, where it dripped into the exposed roots of the pine tree below. Ugh, I cried, turning back around to the others while clutching my wounded hand and my still healthy one. Park rangers always carried a first aid kit on hand, and they quickly helped me apply a bandage to it, wrapping my hand in cotton. What happened? One of the other park rangers asked me, looking at the broken branch ludicrously. It just broke! I snapped back despite myself. My agitation at having been cut by the tree branch when it broke was severe, but then something else dawned on me. How had that tree branch cut me? It broke in the grasp of my hand and shouldn't, shouldn't have been able to move in such a way as to leave a mark this painful. Inadvertently, a shiver went down my spine. I became acutely aware of how many trees were around us. Was I mistaken or had their number increased since I'd last checked? I had to be mistaken. Let's just split up and find Maxie, another park ranger said. I was thankful, given it meant I didn't have to focus on trees anymore. What about this shirt? Another one said, indicating the garment at the top of the tree. We'll come back for it, the first one said dismissively. You know, it's strange. For the life of me, I can't remember their names. See, I was still new at the time, a rookie, really. I barely knew what I was doing. I never saw any of the other park rangers involved in the search for Maxie Payton again. Most of the retired or transferred to a different park, but sometimes. I do wonder if we all came back from the search. We split up into three pairs, moving in a perimeter from Maxie's last known location, the Pine Tree. I was paired up with a man whose name escapes me, and I just know he's Hispanic, and that's all I can really remember about him. We were sent north in case Maxie, or whatever was left of him, had somehow gotten there. The others went east and west. If we found anything, we had to radio it in and then come back. If we found a body, we had to leave it undisturbed. That was obvious, of course, but I really hoped we wouldn't find anything. Because what we'd found so far just didn't sit right with me. How did his shoe get 50 yards from his last known location? As I thought back to the moment when I had found that shoe, I began playing it over and over in my head. Something was nagging me about it. A bell, said my partner. What? I replied. You ever climbed trees as a kid? I nodded. My face was beaming as I thought back to those happy days. When my partner grimaced, however, I blinked, confused. What's wrong? Shaking his head, and my partner muttered something in Spanish under his breath before he answered. I did too. A few times, but... He stopped walking and turned to face me. One time, I was climbing a tree. Something happened. What? I asked, curious if this had anything to do with our current situation. I was back in Mexico, before my family immigrated to the States. There was a tree in my abuela's backyard. I climbed it every time I went over. One time, when I climbed to the very top, I was looking out over the entire land around my abuela's house. I felt like I was king of the world. And I saw it. Saw what? My partner didn't answer. He opened his mouth, paused, and then slowly closed it, shaking his head. You wouldn't believe me. Try me, I replied. He sighed then, opening his mouth to say something. When his eyes widened so large, he looked like a fish. He was looking at something behind me. Throwing my brow, I began to turn around when he grabbed my arm in a vice-like grip. Don't, he hissed. Don't look. I couldn't help myself. I wish I had taken his advice when my eyes found the blue shirt of a boy hanging from the bottom branches of a tree with a broken branch, probably about a hundred meters away. Blood was dripping from it onto the roots below. My heart began beating in my chest so fast I thought that it would burst. That's impossible, I muttered, and blinked. What I saw the moment my eyes opened will haunt me forever. The tree had come closer. 
My partner began cursing, letting go of my arm and stumbling back. He crossed himself, saying silent prayers. We have to go, he said with a shaking breath. No! I didn't argue. Instead, I began to run. Instead, I began running, my partner right next to me the whole time. I didn't dare look back once, and neither did he. All thoughts of finding Maxie were gone. For all intents and purposes, he might as well not have existed. At that moment, all that mattered was getting away from that tree. Exhaustion caught up with us eventually, though, and we stopped, panting as we tried to catch our breaths. Did that just happen? I said through painful gasps of air. Did that actually just happen? I don't know, said my partner. Did you see it move? I asked him. No, but I saw the others moving. What? Their branches and leaves are moving. You heard them, right? I nodded. By this point, I was thoroughly done with everything. For lack of a better term, this was just too crazy. I watched them for a while, wondering why they were moving with no wind about them, then... Then... What? I asked him. He looked at me grimly in the eye. I saw a boy, he said. The branches moved aside only briefly, but I saw the body of a little boy. He couldn't have been more than thirteen, but... Amigo, we mustn't find that body. I didn't want to ask. Curiosity got the better of me. Why? Because a thing could never be called human. Not after they're finished with it. What do you mean, finished with it? My partner didn't answer. Instead, he began praying again in a shaking voice, crossing himself over and over. What happened to Maxie's body? I pressed, not consciously. He didn't answer me at first. Instead, he licked his lips, looking around us, eyes darting from one spot to another. When he spoke, his voice was low and shaking. Same thing I saw in my abuela's backyard when I was a child. I didn't say anything about that. I just sat on a stone, leaning backward until my partner grabbed my shoulder. Don't, he whispered. There's a tree behind you. I didn't need to look to know he was right. It was obvious, anyway. We hadn't left the forest, after all. What do we do? I asked him. I kept my eyes on his face intently because looking anywhere else meant seeing a tree. Ignore him. They might leave us alone if we do. So we did. We just sat on the ground, facing each other, catching our breath. I could hear the singing of birds, the gentle flow of a stream nearby, but the only thing I could pay attention to was the sounds the trees made. The soft creaking of wood, the swaying of leaves and branches on this windless day, the trees brushing against each other. Neither of us said anything, just looking at the ground to avoid the awkwardness of staring at each other's faces for who knows how long. The silence between us was marked by a tense patience. Something was going to happen. We could feel it. Even after running from that thing for God knows how long, I didn't believe we'd escaped it. It was still out there, waiting. Just like us. I've heard stories about how some hunters track their prey. They shot it first, critically wounding it, then follow the blood trail it leaves behind, waiting for it to collapse from exhaustion. Why bother letting it put up a struggle when you could just wait it out? I remember those stories when I looked at my hand. The cotton around my palm was soaked in crimson red. Why is this happening? I asked my companion. He said nothing, he just stared at the ground. I've never heard of this before, I continued, my voice dull and tired. I heard stories of Bigfoot and Mothman and freaking Dogmen in Michigan. Some people say they've seen aliens, other goblins and fairies. They always say they see them in the woods, peeking around a corner, watching them hiding behind something like a, a rock or a... Uh, I couldn't say it, because they were still all around us, listening. I've never heard of anyone being hunted by a tree. I said that. I don't know why I did. I guess I accepted the reality of what was happening. That it would make it easier. But it didn't. Because when my partner looked up at me suddenly, I could see it in his eyes. He was disappointed in me. I was talking in the presence of other trees. I didn't care. This was just too weird. Any rational part of my brain was long since dead, unable to deal with how bizarre this was. I wondered if my partner was going through the same thing. Then again, he claimed to have experienced this thing before. Are we sure they're trees? He said slowly. 
like he was talking to a child. What? I answered, and eyes narrowed. My father once told me a story it was about a demon possessing a woman he knew as a child. He said, she was stark raving mad, biting people, scratching her face. When he finished, I couldn't help but wonder if demons only possessed people. Are you, are you saying a demon has possessed a tree and is hunting us? Maybe, he answered. Who knows? I mean, how do we even know if that thing was a tree? It looked like one to me, I replied, trying not to peek over my shoulder to see if it was behind me. Trees don't move that fast. They don't carry on pieces of clothing. They don't... They don't chase people. You said you saw them with a boy's body, I pointed out. My partner swallowed, crossing himself. I did. I did. I wish I hadn't, but I did. And let me tell you, amigo, trees aren't capable of doing what was happening to that boy. I didn't say anything. The sun broke through the leaf canopy above us, and I squinted from the glare. So did my partner. Part of me thought that he'd made a compelling case, but another felt like there was something we were missing. Missing. That was it. When a tree falls, I said, and no one's around to hear it, what sound does it make? My partner furrowed his brow, confused. How do we know trees don't chase people down? How do we know they can't move in the blink of an eye or take a, take a young boy without anyone noticing and carrying away his body? What are you saying, that trees are capable of doing that? Maybe they are, I replied. Maybe we aren't the first I've seen them either. You think there might be others? When you were a kid, you saw something in your grandma's backyard, right? Something involving trees. Through the sun's glare, I could see his face going pale. Maybe you were one of the lucky few to live and tell the tale. What? He said, mouth hanging open. When a person goes missing in the savannah, some people believe they were killed by the local wildlife, and nobody doubts it. Africa is, is full of dangerous beasts. I'll let that sink in. Let my partner begin to understand what I was going to say before I finished. When a person goes missing in the forest, sometimes people assume they're killed by the local wildlife. Mountain lions, bears, wolves, but nobody stops and thinks about the trees all around us. Because nobody ever notices them. I pressed my lips together when I finished. My partner looked at me in disbelief and horror. Dumbfounded. Do you have any proof? Same amount of proof as you. For demons possessing trees. It's only a theory. Then my partner's face brightened with a dark realization. What if... What if we're both wrong? I blinked. My mind began racing with possibilities. What if we were both wrong? What if there wasn't trees or demons, but... Something else entirely? If it was, then... What was after us? I was about to say something when I noticed the shadow which had fallen between us, perfectly still on the ground, like a border keeping us at bay, a long, thick black line, with several appendages sticking outward from it. My heart skipped a beat as my eyes widened. I knew my partner saw it when he cursed, screaming and backing away. However, there was only one part of the shadow which made my blood run cold. One of the appendages was broken, and from it hung the silhouette of a shirt. And slowly, very slowly, it was getting bigger. Unable to help myself, I began following the shadow's trail to its source, knowing full well what had made it. I could see it in my peripheral vision, like a patient hunter, waiting for its prey to roll over and die when I heard the most comforting sound in my life. The distant hum of a car speeding down the road running past us. I turned back to my partner, locking eyes with him. At that moment, we both had the same idea. It was our only chance of getting out of this nightmare. Neither of us knew it would work, but we didn't have a choice because the shadow had nearly doubled in size and a tree was cracking very loudly. We ran faster than I ever had in my life before or since. We ignored everything around us, especially the silent, inescapable trees. We ran across the roots, pushed through their leaves, ducking under their branches, swerving to avoid running into their trunks. I didn't care if I touched them anymore. If I was fast enough, I could get away from them. Then they wouldn't catch me. But what about that infernal creaking, always right at our heels? What would happen when it stopped? We couldn't be near it when that happened. Our very lives depended on it. 
So caught up in sprinting out of those godforsaken trees, I didn't think to look at my path. My foot hit something large and solid, and I cried out, losing my balance. My partner was in front of me and looked over his shoulder. Bewildered, he stopped and he reached out his arms. I grabbed one of them and planted my foot back on the ground, pushing myself forward. Both of us kept running. We didn't need to check on what I had tripped on. It was bound to happen at some point. We'd been running over them for ages. When we saw the gray asphalt on the road, my heart leapt for joy. The creaking behind us had become so distant, growing fainter and fainter. I knew damn well we were safe the moment we reached that road. And then I, I felt something brush against my back. Something I knew all too well. The hard, rigid texture of tree bark. Next thing I knew, I was lying on my back against the burnt asphalt. Panting as I caught my breath, my partner was bent over me, his face obscuring the sun. There were tears running down his face. I saw it touch you, he said to me, weeping. It was so close. So close, I've never seen anyone run as fast as you did. We're safe now. He began murmuring. We're safe. Praise the Lord, we're safe. I looked back at the woods we'd come out of. Marked by broken twigs and foliage pressed into the ground was the spot we'd both burst from onto the asphalt. Beyond it, I saw only trees and not a single blue speck anywhere. I smiled, relieved, and stood up, glancing to the other side of the road, and my smile vanished. And I saw the blue shirt laying on the edge of it. The inside of the collar was facing me, and on the white tag was a name written in black marker. Maxie Payton. I blinked. And it was gone. I didn't tell my partner. He thought we were safe. Why should I take that away from him? Instead, both of us went back to the ranger station, tired, thirsty, starving. The other pairs had already beaten us to the station. When we arrived, they had been trying to work on the radio, but stopped when they saw us come in. Nothing happened to them. They didn't find anything either. They didn't ask where we had been for the last three hours. They knew better than to do that. Nobody ever tried in the days that followed either. We didn't tell anyone about what happened. Some things are better left forgotten. A couple weeks later, my partner resigned. He cited intense emotional trauma as his reason. I did the same thing three months later. I didn't keep in contact with him. He, he didn't try to. Instead, I moved to the city, surrounded by buildings and cars and a modern world. I avoided the parks, botanical gardens, anywhere a single tree is. I stayed away from it. I always believed it was the only way to keep myself safe. I do enjoy going to a park. My apartment overlooks. There's no trees there, only grass and bushes. That is until... I'm not, I'm not sure what to do anymore. Because I had a dream last night. There was a, there was a pine tree in my apartment. One of the lower branches was broken. I thought it was just a symptom of my trauma. And then I saw that tree in the park. And it's getting closer. Hey there once again kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to give you a big thank you for watching tonight's video. If you guys ever wanted to help support the show, you can always do so if you watch the show on youtube.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, or find the Mr. Creepypasta Storytime podcast on iTunes, on Google Play, and on Spotify. And also, if you ever want to check out my wife's tea shop, it's etsy.com slash ivory monocle tea, where she sells hand-blended herbal teas, in the theme of Dungeons and Dragons and Harry Potter and Final Fantasy and the like. You can find the link for it, as well as many, many, many other links, in the description down below. And, drumroll please, a big, big, big thank you to everybody supporting me at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. People such as... Tacia Lynn Ginobaga Arneo, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Dr. Strawberry, Chempinski, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Saeed Elyasin, Buddy Burrows, Stephen Van Hus, Kai Albertson, Goonington, G Weevil 3, Chance Burnett, Diane Krauss, Asia, 
Gabrielle DeBaca, the Red Oak Shield virus, Cindy Barney, Titty Connoisseur, <laughs> really? Titty Connoisseur? Melissa Swigart, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, Cross Rights, The Ginger Bros, Eliminator 86, Andrew Steinberg, Jason Sistma, Holy Realm, and Rafael Rodriguez. Thank you so much to you guys out there on Patreon, to all of you listening to either the podcast or the YouTube show. And that is everything, guys. Thank you so much for listening, and sweet dreams. <laughs>